Hey, Jonathan Baylor here, and welcome to The Sane Show, where starvation isn't healthy, where the dinner table is for family and food, not calorie counting and math, and where we eat more to burn more and heal ourselves so that we can enjoy radically more vibrant and fulfilling lives. Oh, yes, and The Sane Show is brought to you by not a bunch of advertisements. Instead, we'd love to help you save time and money getting the healthiest and most helpful superfoods on the planet delivered right to your doorstep at store.sanesolution.com. Again, store.sanesolution.com. Hey, everybody. Jonathan Baylor here with, I don't know, this might be the single greatest podcast uh, ever I, I, simply because uh, if I had to list and I don't I don't want to I don't want to go too over the top here but literally if I had to list authors who have had the biggest influence on my life first not for this is in no particular order Aristotle Victor Frankl Stephen Covey and today's guest a man who really needs no other introduction for anyone who's plugged into the nutrition scene at all Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Taubes is here. What's up, Gary? Hey, I'm still trying to figure out who those other writers are. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're probably a little familiar with Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I thought you said Eric Stottle. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, no, okay. no. Okay, we're ready to go. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. You're right up there with uh, Aristotle, Stephen Covey, and Victor Frankl. So there you go. And, oh, and, okay. and probably and probably Mihaly Cheekset Mihai over at the University of Chicago, the guy who did all the flow work. So yeah, I, I, read, I actually interviewed uh, Cheekset Mihai. I don't know. I interviewed him in my earlier life as a science journalist. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, I would have thrown Norman Juster into that. <laughs> but then you'd probably take yourself off the list because I can't imagine that your own writing has influenced you. More, no, I'm just kidding. More than Norman Justice, absolutely not. You're right. I would have to take myself off the list and put <laughs> Norman Justice on the list. <laughs> well, uh, Gary, for for uh, individuals who are maybe a little bit less familiar with your work, can you quickly, because 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 I want to just get into it during this podcast, and I want people to understand a little bit about the man they're hearing from. So you've had numerous awards, numerous books. Can you just quickly take us through your CV? Uh, CV, okay. Well, um, I, you know, I, I was a physics writer. I have a physics degree. Um, and I got involved in writing about controversial science in the mid-'80s. I got my first book. I went to live at this large physics lab outside Geneva CERN where they recently discovered the Higgs boson. And I thought I was going to be covering a great physics breakthrough, and I turned out to be watch 150 very smart physicists discover non-existent elementary particles. <clears throat> and um, I got obsessed with the subject of controversial science, how, to, how easy it is to get the wrong answer in science and how hard it is to get the right answer. And after doing a couple of uh, investigative articles and uh, another book that touched on this subject, it was called Bad Science, so you could get the take. Um, well, some of my friends in the physics community said to me, if you're fascinated with bad science, you should look at some of this stuff in public health. <laughs> so in the early 90s, I moved into public health, and I ended up by the late 90s writing a couple of major pieces for the journal Science on some of the you know, conventional wisdom, the dogma and nutrition that has very little evidence to support it, as it turned out, so it justified the term bad science to describe it, and that led me to write a legendary New York Times, well, infamous or famous, depending on your perspective, <laughs> New York Times Magazine story, uh, What if Fat Doesn't Make You Fat, and that... Uh, led me to doing two books, which is the reason why I'm here. <clears throat> Excuse me, one is Good Calories, Bad Calories, and the other is called Why We Get Fat. And they're both, uh, is the subtitle of the first suggest challenge of conventional wisdom on diet, nutrition, and chronic disease. You know, I learned an extraordinary amount. I, my, I went through much of the same learning process I assume you did, and um, it uh, depressing 
<laughs> dismaying to learn uh, about the evidence base for not just our beliefs, but what you know our dietary guidelines have been told to do for the past 50 years, 40 years. Well, and, and Gary, what, what, I mean, uh, obviously there's so much that is wrong and, and, and bad, but the thing that I wanted to dig into with you briefly is there's this, you know, the, the idea that fat makes you fat, right, is probably the most common myth uh, out there. And the thing that I was talking with actually Dr. Ron Rosedale the other day, and he made a point, he's just like, I don't, this, this actually isn't controversial. The idea that in fact, a diet composed of more fat if anything, makes your body better at burning fat because it becomes more of a preferred fuel source. Therefore, if you are in a state where you don't have enough calories, your body's like, well, I like burning fat and I see this fat already sitting on your hips, so I'm just gonna burn that and I don't have excess insulin lying around to block it. So like, why is the theory that eating fat makes you fat, which is intuitive but wrong, stick while the fact that eating fat helps you to burn fat which is just as, in some ways, intuitive because it's just your body wants to burn what you eat, and if you don't eat enough of it, it'll eat it off your body. Why is one sticking and one isn't? Well, and I'm going to challenge you on this, that there's a more pervasive um, <clears throat> misconception out there that then in turn leads to the secondary misperception that it's all about, misconception that it's all about dietary fat driving. Uh, weight gain, and the, the, so the more common and the, the, the more problematic and the sort of fundamental pillar of all our nutritional beliefs is that obesity is an energy issue, mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. a, a caloric balance issue, that your body, you know, even, you know, you said if you don't have enough calories, your body will burn fat, and I would argue that your body's going to burn fat anyway if you don't... Uh, trigger the hormones and enzymes that make it store fat. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this idea that, that uh, well, the technical term is obesity is an energy balance disorder, but that, that, that what we should care about is the calories we consume minus the calories we expend. And it's all about eating too much and exercising too little. And if you care about eating too much, then, then caloric intake is what's driving fat accumulation, and fat has the densest calories diet. So back in the 1960s, 1970s, when the obesity researchers or the nutritionists wanted to blame heart disease on eating dietary fat, um, and since obese individuals often uh, get a lot of heart disease, obesity is associated with heart disease, they thought these things have to be caused by the same thing. So if dietary fat causes heart disease, it's got to cause obesity. How could it do that? Well, maybe it's just there's such dense calories in here, nine calories per gram compared to four calories for protein and carbohydrates. So they, it wasn't actually until the 1960s, 1970s that people started pushing this idea that it was dietary fat that caused us to get obese. And it was so it would, you know, it, it would, could coexist nicely with this idea that dietary fat, saturated fat, causes heart disease. Mm. But the, the fundamental error in thinking is that it's about calories anyway, as opposed to just thinking of obesity as a kind of gross defect, you know, like mm -hmm. any other, I mean, if any other part of your body started expanding out of control, yeah, the doctors would be like, whoa, what's going on? You know, what hormones and enzymes are out of control here that he's got this sort of huge lump of whatever growing out of his forehead mm -hmm. or his, you know, ankles or his, but if it's your gut, or your, yeah. it's because you're eating too much. Exactly. Um, well, and, and Gary, what, I, I'm actually not sure. I've, I literally have a playlist on my uh, phone called Gary Taub's Interviews. And I think I've listened to every interview you've ever done, at least the ones that are available on iTunes. And the one question that I actually don't know if you've ever been asked directly, or I'm not sure if I've heard you answer it, and I'm super, super curious as to the way you would frame your answer. So hey, are, are you ready? Okay, <laughs> true. Okay. I'm still trying to get over you listening to every interview I've ever done, which then means I have to think of new ways to say the same thing again. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. All right, all right. Um, so if, and again, this is, this is um, I, and the reason I'm asking you this is because I get asked this question. I'm just curious how, how you, your answer compares to mine. 
so uh, when I when I talk to someone and I say, I mean, generally my message is, it, it's the quality of the food you're eating makes the quantity of food you're eating irrelevant. And then people come back to me and they say, well, if I were to eat, if I were to just drink, if I were to go on a butter fast and drink 10,000 calories of butter per day for a week, are you saying that I will not gain fat? And what, how would you respond to that? Uh, go ahead. Have a good time. <laughs> Back to me. If you think you can do that, I actually had this conversation with a very good friend the other day. He said, I can eat 10,000 calories a day. If I just, I could do 7,000 calories in cashews and 3,000 in heavy cream, and I'm going to get fatter, right? And I said, well, actually, I don't know if you're going to get fatter. I don't know what your body's going to do. I know it's not going to like it. And the seventh out interesting choice was cashews because they turn out to be 20% carbs by calories. <laughs> You're like, so there's your problem. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons, no, one of the reasons why you can eat 7,000 calories of cashews is because you're going to be secreting insulin that will help you store the calories, get those the calories out of your bloodstream so more can get in there. Um, here's the way, it, you know, this is, it's a fascinating because that's a common response. Are you saying if I do X, like, one of the reasons why obesity researchers insisted obesity was caused by overeating is they knew that they could, you can slim somebody down by starving them, right? So you could say to yourself, if I starve myself for the next six months, I'm going to lose weight, right? I'm going to lose fat. Therefore, overeating is an energy thing. I just have to restrict energy. And then, yes, that's true, but the fact is you can voluntarily starve yourself for the next six months because your body... You're, you are a biological system with all these compensatory homeostatic phenomena that are going to fight starvation if there is food available. Okay? So the problem here is it's a, it's a rhetorical question. If I could force myself to eat 10,000 calories a day of fat, and I kept that up long enough, mm -hmm. yes, I am sure that you would probably gain fat. Your body's going to have to do something with those calories. It's going to stick them in the fat tissue. <clears throat> But this is a different issue than why, and this was actually Ed, Edwin Astwood, the endocrinologist, wrote about this. I quote him in Good Calories, Bad Calories, back, I think, in the early 1960s in an article on obesity. And he said, sure, you can, you know, we can make geese fat by force feeding them. And I'm sure you could do it with people, he said, but that's not how the circus fat lady got there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. The fact is, obese people get obese without doing that. Exactly. So the question is, why? And then the other side to this is there actually have been experiments where they've tried to do similar things, and I discussed that also in Good Calories, Bad Calories. So back in the late 60s, Ethan Sims did these experiments in New England where um, he wanted to fatten up subjects and see whether it was carbs or fat that made them fatter and study the fattening process. So it's what the interesting thing is he first started with college students and he tried to get them 20% fatter and he couldn't do it, which makes me think college students in the late 60s are different than college students today, right? <laughs> because it should, you know, there's this famous freshman 20 or whatever it is, which I think is up to the freshman 30. So <laughs> Anyway, so then he went to convicts at, uh, I always forget if it's Vermont or New Hampshire, I think it was the Vermont State Prison. Um, and the very first experiment they tried to do was to get them fat, and they never published this because they considered it a failed experiment. They, but they thought, we're going to show that you can get people fat on an Atkins diet, even though Atkins wasn't around yet. So, But it was a pure meat diet, fatty meat, and they described these convicts. I interviewed virtually all of his collaborators, including Sims himself. And his collaborators described these convicts sitting there with plates of pork chops in front of them that they refused to eat. So they couldn't get them to eat enough to get fat on this diet. And several of his collaborators said, I challenge anyone to get fat on, on an Atkins point diet. Although this doesn't mean I, I, there are people out on the Internet, and I've gotten emails from people who say this has happened to them, so I think it can happen. But for the huge proportion of people, you just can't eat enough to get fatter. And, and then Gary, what... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, the, so then what they tried to do is they decided they'd start with the convict's baseline diet, and then they'd get them to overeat by either carbohydrates or fat. And they'd 
began to try to get them to put on 20% excess weight. So 200 pounds, it would get to 240, which is a lot. And so with the carbohydrates, they realized that they could get them to, eat, to go from, say, eating 3,000 calories a day to as many as 10,000 calories a day just by adding carbs. And then they'd say they'd go to bed hungry, okay, after tripling their caloric intake. But when they tried to get them <clears throat> to add fat to their diet, they had trouble doing it. So finally, you know, they tried to get them to eat one extra stick of butter, like 800 calories of fat extra a day. And in the various articles they published on this, they were to it as like the heroic effort of getting, of overeating on dietary fat, even though their baseline diet had carbs in it. Mm -hmm. So one of the points I'm trying to get people to understand is that you can't divorce the regulation of appetite from the regulation of energy storage, which is what we're talking about, you know, the, the, the uh, hormonal enzymatic regulation of fat metabolism and fatty acid um, availability for other tissues to burn for fuel, if you try to force that by, say, forcing someone over eat, it's going to feed back on appetite and energy expenditure in such a way that they're not going to be able to do it. And, and here, just to bring that home, it, it, the concrete example, actually one of the experiences in my life that led me down this path was I, I, I wasn't a participant in one of those formal experiments, but I was uh, an, an individual who was naturally thin. And I have Excel spreadsheets from when I was in university trying to gain weight because I would right. track what I was eating. And I would do, I would do a double shot of olive oil like six times a day. Like I would just shoot glasses of oil in addition right. to my, my normal diet. I was consuming about 6,000 calories per day. And I, I was trying, actively trying to gain weight and I was not. I went to the bathroom a heck of a lot more, but I didn't actually gain weight. Well, this is what, I mean, it's really fascinating. And it's the kind of experiment, what you just described is one of the experiments that I would uh, eventually like to see our not-for-profit, which I hope we'll talk about, the Nutrition Science Initiative Fund. I mean, that's an extreme example of it. But, and again, I, I talked about this in Good Calories, Bad Calories. He's one of the leading obesity researchers in um, the UK. A guy named Garrow tried, in effect, the same experience. He said to himself, I want to prove, I want to see how hard it is for a lean person to gain weight. Mm -hmm. Because if it's hard for a lean person to gain weight, then why wouldn't I expect it to be hard for an obese person to get lean? And he tried a lot of varieties trying to force himself to eat a thousand, I think it was a thousand calories a day. And finally he settled on um, basically keeping cookies by his side all the time, you know, at his desk, at his bed. And every time he thought about it, he, he forced himself to eat another cookie. And he did manage to gain about 15 or 20 pounds over a few months of hard, hard work. And then as soon as he stopped the cookies, the weight went away. And his conclusion was, if it's, if it's so hard for a lean person to get fat, then obviously this isn't, there's something else happening. Absolutely. With people who get fat easily. You know, I have a brother, two years older than me. We were growing up. He was a kind of lean, you know, uh, you could see the veins on his arms when he was eight years old. And every, I mean, he's just tall, lean, thin, and I was the chunky one. And we both ate as much food as humanly possible. In fact... I joke, you know, our dinners would last. This was back when my mother was a wonderful cook. We'd sit down to dinner at 7, we'd be done by 7.18, and my brother and I would have each polished off three courses. Um, because, and if we didn't eat fast, if I was lollygagging, he'd get to the food before I could. And yet I grew up to be 6'2", and at my heaviest when I was playing football, I was almost 240, again, trying to be as heavy as possible. And I don't think he ever got over 195, and he was 6'5". He ran track and did, you know, ran, was a distance runner and a rower. I became a football player. Anatomy is destiny, as Freud said. But it's sort of, we just did something different with the food we ate. It wasn't about how much we ate. And he wasn't lean because he was an endurance runner and a rower. He was an, oh, an endurance runner because he was lean and his body wanted, you know, that's, those were the sports for him. Absolutely. Um, well, and and yeah. we forget we forget about an entire population when we have these conversations, right? I mean, there's an entire population of people who are chronically underweight and are taking weight gainers and are right. seeing, I mean, and so, so if it is just 
that's what I don't get, Gary, is some of this stuff, like, it doesn't even seem like it's controversial. Like, but, 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 it's, but it remains controversial, whereas, like, a common sense, you can say, like, if you eat the same way you ate when you were 15, when you're 55, you will gain weight, even if you eat the exact same way. Therefore, it can't just be about calories in, calories out. Like, Although, in that sense, you know, what they're going to do, the, the, the counter-argument is that is the belief that your metabolism slowed down, slows down. So, you know, you can eat, you can be six foot 190 at 15 and eat 3,000 calories a day, but at 50, at six foot 190, you've got to eat 2,000 because your metabolism slows. That's the belief. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's fascinating. When I was, and, it, you know, we all go through this when we're young. It's one of the annoying things, by the way, when you get criticized by 23-year-old self-appointed nutrition gurus instead of 56-year-old self-appointed nutrition gurus like myself. I want to say, look, don't you understand? When I was 23, I could eat anything. <laughs> and I had to try to get bigger. You know, it was hard work. Now I could do it effortlessly. You know, I could probably get up to 300 pounds if I wanted to. Oh, and one, ask, ask a post-menopausal woman. Right. I mean, these yeah. are these are the individuals who, who I work with. I, literally, I what do I we call it um, side effect fat loss, where you'll have a, a, a postmenopausal woman who will be she will eliminate fattening foods from her diet, replace them with non fattening foods, uh, and she will maybe see some results, maybe. But it's but her husband, who's just getting this second hand because maybe she's the one who takes care of the meals in the house. He's just. Weight's just falling off. He's just burning fat. He doesn't even know what's going on. He's like, look, honey, my pants are falling off. And she's just like, damn you. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, what do you do with those women? Because I hear from those people. And I, you know, I understand that they're secreting less estrogen. Estrogen suppresses fat formation. So they're fighting against hormones. I'm not eating too much. But, but what do you, have you found something that, you know, carb restrict, boom. But what else do you have to do? Well, what else yeah, do they I, have to do? And I, I know this should be about me. But. No, no, no. I think it's it's actually, I sometimes, like one of the things I actually like about what Tim Ferriss talked about in his work is he joked, he joked, and this is a joke, that first they do them to racehorses. First they take a technique and they apply it to racehorses. Then they take a technique and they apply it to bodybuilders. And then if it works, you might get like a teeny tiny sliver of it enters popular culture. And I think this, and again, listeners don't take this the wrong way, but if we can do things to essentially help a woman's body to work more like a man's body, and this involves things like uh, very intense strength training, uh, it involves things like the way they manage stress. Like traditionally, women tend to um, not compartmentalize as well as men, and therefore will have uh, higher chronic levels of stress hormones. Whereas, you know, like their husband gets home and he just sits down and veges out, she's worried. So, if, if you can, like, for example, take the uh, exercise related hormones and flip those into more of a, a male burn fat rather than store fat. Uh, type of dynamic as well as having your stress hormones shift in favor of being less stressed I think uh, it's certainly not a magic pill but I've seen it help a lot and certainly that does need to and to be very clear none of that matters if the diet isn't right I mean that what you're eating is such a huge component but it's a bit like if you aren't a naturally thin person you essentially have to look at every area of your life and what you can do to make because again like even how much you sleep you know i mean even how much you sleep affects your hormonal balance so that quality and quantity of sleep it just gets harder i mean i and that's it stinks but it, it's just reality sadly <laughs> yeah. no some things just aren't fair i wonder actually if there's an evolutionary side to it as well um but it stretches it's a just so story. But, um, well, and Gary, just one yeah. other thing I wanted to dig into really quick because, and I certainly want to talk about what we can do to help solve this with your work with NUSAI. But one thing that you do so well is you tackle this problem of causality. And, and that is so, so important. And you touched on that earlier where you said, for example, a person will eat less and they'll lose weight. So then they'll say, therefore, 
weight is gained when you eat too much, which is a bit like saying, okay, I have a fever, I get into an ice bath, my body temperature goes down, therefore uh, the fever was caused by me being in too hot of an environment to begin with. Like you can't, these, these, these causal associations are just ludicrous. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, this is what, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you run into this also. I mean, one is indeed that, that the, um, the, the obesity research community just hang on, hung on to this idea that you can, if you can starve people and make them get, lose weight, therefore, um, they got fat to begin with by eating too much. I mean, the therefore that I inserted is, is completely, um, uh, uh, logically incorrect, but that tends to be how we think. Um, the other way that this manifests itself is if you go on a, for instance, carbohydrate-restricted diet and you both lose weight and eat less, therefore the eating less was what caused the weight loss. So what we do all over, you know, throughout our lives is we tend to insert causal pathways into observations that we see that idea whether they really are causal or not so this happens simultaneously with that therefore this caused that or that caused this and depending on the preconceptions the other um science is ultimately about establishing this is something claude bernard said and i've been writing about science for about 25 years when i read this claude bernard was this legendary french physiologist who lived in the 19th century and um <clears throat> wrote a great book called the An Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine, the first third of which I think should be required reading for anyone who in science or thinking about science. And Bernard said that basically science is about trying to come up with causes for the things that we see. So you observe something in nature and you want to figure out what caused it, whether it's <clears throat> you know, the, the, the universe the, in, in the night sky or the extra fat you've got on your body and um, the way you do that, you can't do it usually from observation. It's almost unless it's something blatant, like right? you see somebody fire a gun and the person next to them, you know, falls over dead with a hole in them, you can imply that the causality was fairly clear. But in most of them, it's kind of complicated, and that's when you do experiments. And, um, you know, in this sense, what I find detrimental, it was the, the idea that, you know, if you make someone eat less and they lose weight, therefore they got fat by eating too much is statistic. But also this idea that if a diet, if you eat less on a diet, that means and, and you lose weight, that means the diet works by make, by eating less, and that somehow sucks the necessary fat out of your fat tissue. And that's equally as, um, as pernicious in this field because you want to know. If a diet, if, if a particular regimen of eating works, why did it work? Like, why did, this is an experience virtually all of us have who try carbohydrate-restricted diets at one point. You spend your whole life, um, if you're predisposed to be heavy, um, trying to control it, trying to regulate it, usually by some form of eating less. And, you know, even when I was younger, I, said, I dieted off and on throughout the 90s. I worked out all the time. Or actually, from the 80s to the 90s, my whole life I was basically trying to maintain a certain weight that was, say, 10 pounds lower than whatever I was. Mm -hmm. And I, I was hungry all the time. I hated dieting. I don't understand it. I mean, there's this, just this idea, and you think about food constantly. When can I have my next meal? How much could I eat? How slowly should I eat it to make it last as long as possible? You know, what foods can I order that will minimize the calories in it? I used to go on sushi diets. <laughs> Somewhere I read that a full plate of sushi was only 300 calories. It was interesting. I'd lose like 10 pounds in two weeks, and then I'd want to blow my brains out. I'd have to have a quarter pound of cheese. To make it. Um, anyway, and then you, you do this, so you restrict carbohydrates. You don't worry about fat. And you eat, you know, all these foods that will supposedly kill you, and suddenly the weight just falls off. You know, and you're not hungry. And it's this experience of losing weight without hunger that, to me, is one of the fundamental observations in the field. It goes against everything. Like all the, you know, the conventional wisdom is the only way to lose weight is to eat less or exercise more. I mean, to 
create a negative energy balance. And how do you know you're in negative energy balance? Because you're hungry. Suddenly, here's this way where you lose weight without hunger, and it tells you something fundamentally different. Well, and 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 Gary, I think that is just so this this issue of of, of causality and what follows what. Some of the, I think, I mean, that's what what you do is is so important to help people to take a step back. And an analogy that I've tried to use, um, that is so right, that the traditional mindset that we're talking about here is you eat more food and that causes you to have more body fat. And like, let's, let's actually take a step back and there's, there's two, two points to make. One is if you eat more junk, like if you eat more garbage, yeah, what that actually causes is you're actually eating more of the foods that cause you to become fat and then you become fat, but you're not fat because you ate more food, you ate more fattening foods and right. and and that's the key distinction there is that yes people who eat a lot of a traditional western diet oftentimes are fat but that's because they're eating a lot of a traditional western diet like and wh- why is it so hard to get the mainstream to accept the fact that it's not eating a lot of food it's eating a lot of the wrong types of foods and there's that just step in the middle, right? It's it's eat more food is not the problem. Eat, but if you ate more junk food and that caused the amount of fattening foods you ate to go up, then body fat goes up. I get that. The extension to exercise that I try to use that I think people grok somewhat immediately is people. I haven't heard the word grok used in the conversation. <laughs> 1984. Thank you. Well, no, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, it's pretty cool beans. There's another old friend who's saying the. Uh, <laughs> So when people think, people often think you exercise, or let's for a man, uh, if a man wants to build muscle, what does he do? Exercise. Therefore, exercise causes your muscles to grow. Uh, but there's another way a man can make his muscles grow. Inject steroids. If a man injects steroids into his body and just sits down, muscle will, be, will, will grow. So that then says, okay, well, it's actually hormones that are closer to the causal agent of muscle development. And so, wait, what does exercise have to do with this? Oh, okay, maybe exercise triggers the hormones, which then trigger muscle development. Okay, and people seem to get that. So we say, okay, imagine if food did something similar, meaning food doesn't actually make you fat. Food triggers hormones, and those hormones dictate whether or not you're becoming fat. What do you think about that? Crazy. (laughs) <laughs> absolute, That's not absolute quackery. <laughs> Don't you believe in the laws of thermodynamics? <laughs> Be serious. Um, and no, I mean, it's a great... I, I use uh, height for the metaphors, um, you know, and the same thing. But I, I make them the same argument. It's, it's, it, the child's growing. You're never going to say that he's growing because he's eating more than he's expending. You know, they're absolutely certain. The reason he's growing is pituitary gland is secreting growth hormone that's stimulating in some like growth factor that's telling his cells and his bones and everything to grow and he's eating to compensate right but it's again as soon as you get to the fat tissue it's got to be about this energy balance thing actually one of the same way you were talking about causality was interesting one of the reasons um people believe exercise is so important for weight loss right is because they look at marathon runners and they're so slender you know? And how is it hard not to believe that if I, and I, I fell for this for decades, I kept thinking if I somehow ran enough, I would go from being the sort of hippopotamus that <laughs> my body kind of wants to be, uh, maybe not a hippopotamus, but a basset hound, <laughs> to a greyhound. You know, if you just do it literally, I could picture in my head for decades that if I could just get my distance up far enough, I would somehow become one of these people who just, you know, flew over the, the road and ran effortlessly, and and it's just my body didn't do that. And in fact, the, the joke is I can never get far enough before something would break down my back, my knees. Um, and yet, like I said, my brother could do 10 miles run like it was a walk around the block for me. That's what his body did. But the, we see, we, you see these marathon runners and, you know, and the joke is, like, you could imagine thinking, boy, if I only ran 26 miles a day, I, too, would become five foot six, 120 pounds of Kenyan. <laughs> One of the, actually, the best, I use this in, in Why We Get Fat. Um, 
but I found I've started doing it more when I lecture, and I lectured a couple weeks ago actually to uh, cancer surgeons. Got them all nodding, but this idea that if you wanted to make yourself hungry, what would you do? You know, if I was having a huge dinner party tonight and I had the ten best chefs in the, the, the you know Oakland coming to cook dinner, and I invited you, and the invitation said the best food you've ever tasted. It's like one of these top chef you know dinners, and it's going to be endless portions, one wonderful taste sensation after another and I want you to come and I want you to come hungry. Bring your appetite. What would you do? And the answer, obvious answer, is like, you know, eat less during the day, right? Maybe skip lunch even and certainly skip your afternoon snack and eat smaller portions and and you probably exercise more too. So you'd you didn't have a workout plan, you'd do a workout. If you had a workout, you'd make it a longer workout. Now you might say, I'm going to walk to Taos' house. It's only five miles. I still have <laughs> appetite. So the exact same things that normal people would do to make sure that they're hungry are the two things, eat less, exercise more, that we tell overweight people to do to lose weight. And that alone should tell you that there's something fundamentally wrong with how we think about this. And yet I could have the same conversation with, uh, you know, one of the obesity researchers in the world, and they'll, they'll, they'll look at me like they're talking to a creationist or something. Yeah, and that's, again, Gary, that's exactly, like you just said, the, the very thing that stimulates appetite the most is the thing we tell people to do to uh, com combat this condition. And I, the, the similar, along those similar veins, if, if you actually look physiologically at what happens to the body, when you do starve it, it's literally like if you describe the analogy of, of, a, of a basset hound versus a greyhound. And in some ways, what I think what we're talking about here is, in the, is there a, rather than taking the body of a greyhound and try to make the greyhound run until it turns into the basset hound, like the body's different. We got to understand that. And the, I think the more productive approach is to say, okay, is there anything that can be done to take the body of uh, someone who is naturally more predisposed to burning, uh, excuse me, storing fat and make it work like the body of someone who is more predisposed to burning fat. And if you look at what actually happens in the body when you starve yourself is your body shifts more towards the spectrum of an individual predisposed to storing fat. And, and right. so like you're literally, you're literally making your body in more into the chronic state it's like you're worsening your fever the thing you're doing to try to cure your fever is actually like compounding the virus in your body all right so all stop right. <laughs> stop don't starve yourself it's bad yeah but this seems simple to us why is it so difficult for other people to understand well and that's let's, let's i mean let's, and you've probably asked me this question already but literally i You know, you talk to a, a, a the, 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 the large proportion of individuals in the obesity research community and the journalists who cover it can hear this over and over again, and it will not stick. This has no effect on their thinking process. And we can talk about cognitive dissonance and group things if you want, but it's very difficult. And, you know, I've got 10th graders in high school who write me and get it instantly. <laughs> and yet you have really smart people like when I sometimes I try to understand what you say to a lot of Republicans in the country there must be some really smart Republicans right so therefore I should talk to them and understand why we just can't agree on anything <laughs> um, but here it's sort of like, these are really smart people what is it that makes it so hard to understand that you're just talking about, you know, it, even just not to agree with, just understand that it's not some weird rhetorical game we're playing and that it's got nothing to do with whether the laws of thermodynamics are true or not because they're always true, you know, and that it's just that there can be a different causality to this. I, I feel about a month ago I was lecturing to um, cardiologists and I said, why is it that obesity is in, in your entire medical career, from the minute you're in this med school to the day you retire, 
there is only one disorder that you ever go to a physics textbook that's a means of mm-hmm. cure and prevention and to understand and that's obesity. Every other disorder you're ever confronted with, whatever it is, you'll go to a medical textbook or a biochemistry textbook or an endocrinology textbook. Suddenly here it's like a physics problem. It's crazy. Well, and, and Gary, I think, and this is just, uh, I think, it may be a semantic issue, but I don't know if it actually is. Um, if, if, if I go to someone and I say eating less and exercising more, like uh, essentially if you could eat nothing and just walk all day long, um, if I were to say to them, that is not a, that will not cause you to lose weight. Of course they would say I'm crazy. And in fact, I would be crazy because the statement of if I ate no calories and walked all day, I would lose weight is true. Uh, however, I think what we're it's actually tied to that ten thousand calories a day. Exactly. 10, calories a day. Oh, exa- exactly. Exactly. But but my, my macro point is that I don't think our goal is actually just to lose weight. I think the conversation we're actually having is how do we keep our body from storing excess body fat sustainably for the rest of our life. And like if, if, if you were to say, well, the way you do that is just by uh, like not sleeping for the rest of your life, people would look at you and say, you're crazy because they'd say, well, Gary, I need to sleep. Like sleeping is required. I can't just sleep less. Like my, eventually my body will win. But that is what people say. Well, you just need to eat less. But I can't. Yes, eating less will cause weight loss, but it will cause temporary weight loss. I'll get dehydrated. I'll burn off my muscle tissue. So is what we're talking about weight loss or is what we're talking about long-term fat loss? Well, and that's it, yeah. What you want is long-term fat loss. You don't want to just, you, you can semi-starve yourself or even starve yourself and force a short-term effect from it. But even if you could keep it up for life, you would not be healthier for doing it. Exactly. I, think I was just talking to an uh, email conversation with a psychologist today. So there's actually a new... Um, sort of anorexia syndrome that's going to be in the next um, uh, BSM stand for. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's women who are not emaciated mm-hmm. but don't eat. Mm-hmm. So even there, it's sort of an unhealthy... The question is, you're, what you want is your body to work to be to work like a healthy body. So you want it to burn fat like a healthy person. Burn. You want it to have metabolic flexibility in effect so you can store fat and burn it and be healthy and your risk factors for heart disease are healthy. And, um, you know, there's sort of, it, it, sometimes the, one of the arguments against what I've been arguing, I, I think what you're arguing is that, you know, this isn't just about weight loss, it's about health. Is that we're arguing that you give up carbohydrates, yes, you'll be, you'll, you know, look better and you'll be slimmer, but you'll be less healthy. And the point is you will be more healthy than you want. Starvation is not a means to increase uh, long-term health. It's just a short-term, you know, uh, 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 behavioral uh, activity that that is going to do more harm than good probably in the short term. And it's actually one of the reasons this idea that eating less is the way to cure obesity or to treat it or to treat excess weight may be one of the reasons why there's this observation now that may or may not be true that, that overweight individuals are actually, you know, have less morbidity and mortality than people with BMI from 20 to 25 or supposedly in an ideal way. It could be that because people are trying to starve themselves to get into that. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's true because it's hard to extend. Oh, absolutely. One, if, and if one assumes that one must eat a diet that contains these fattening starches and sweets. Like if, and that's the other, I think, uh, problem here, Gary, is if, like, let's, let's assume, like, most of the people out there, that that is truth. Like, you have to eat starches and sweets. Like, that's only, only a reasonable, that's only the reason, that's the reasonable thing to do. Well, then if you were to eat less of that diet, you would be better off but not because you're eating less, but because you're eating less of the fattening foods. Right. It's just like if, you, if we assume that everyone has to smoke, if you were to smoke one pack a day versus two packs a day, 
that would be preferable, but why not just not smoke? Yeah, it's interesting. One of the um, studies that was published in the last few years was on calorie restriction, calorie restricted diets and primates. Um, there were rhesus monkeys. Oh, the yes, yeah. The life extension one. Yeah, and it was fascinating because I was talking to the fellow who did the research, uh, Rick Weindrick, and he pointed out, and so one of the interesting things, you calorie restrict these monkeys, and they, 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 they couldn't show that they lived longer, but they had uh, less diabetes and cancer. And they still got diabetes and cancer. So, if you know, from reading my books, there's reasonable evidence that diabetes and cancer in the Western diets or civilizations, and that... Uh, populations eating their traditional diets, absent sugar and white flour, and maybe vegetable oils didn't get these diseases. So I was curious why the calorie-restricted primates would still get diabetes and cancer, and I asked Weindrick what the diet was, and it turns out that these diets are about 30% sugar, and I think it was 20% corn starch, and the, um, this is a diet that some organization decided would be diet in which these monkeys thrived in captivity, by which they probably meant they looked plump <laughs> and healthy. <laughs> and so when you're calorie restricting a diet that's 30% sugar, right, they're getting significantly less sugar. Exactly. So that could explain why they're healthier, but if they didn't get any sugar and any corn starch and just ate their natural diet, they might be able to eat as much as they want and not get diabetes and cancer at all. But those studies don't get funded. Well, and that is that is why you exist, sir. So let's let's transition the last part of the interview into you have done an amazing job, uh, arguably better than anyone else in the industry, of exposing the problem here. And now you're focused on helping to engineer a solution with your nonprofit organization. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay. Well, so this is um, with uh, Dr. Peter Atia in San Diego. So he deserves as much credit or more. Uh, we met a couple of years ago after he had uh, gone through his own learning experience with his own weight and much of the research that we did and then had read my books and we decided that we were going to do something about this. We didn't know what it was. But the easiest thing to do, one of the ideas I always had was there's some simple experiments that could be done that could demonstrate, again, that, that the weight loss on a carbohydrate-restricted diet is a different phenomena than weight loss on a calorie-restricted diet. And you could, in effect, disassociate the weight loss from calorie restriction. And I thought that if you could do that, you can do it in animals, but people don't pay attention to these animal studies. So I thought if we could do this in humans, we might get the obesity research community to begin to understand something they never wanted to study. So their uh, perspective towards these carbohydrate-restricted diets is they're fads that just sort of fool people into eating less. Maybe people eat less because they're bored or they're, they just can't buy enough non-carb food to eat as much as they used to. And so, yeah, sure, people lose weight, but they do it because they eat less, and um, they don't stand the diets anyway, so it's not relevant. They never saw these diets as relevant to the question of why we get fat. And I thought their particular experiments could be done, well-controlled experiments. We just needed the mechanism to fund these experiments. Incredibly naive. But Peter and I, with the help of um, uh, some wonderful friends of Peter, started uh, doing the legal work to start this not-for-profit that we call the Nutrition Science Initiative. Because one of the things we want to do with the the ultimate mission is to reduce the burden of obesity and diabetes, but the, the strategy to do it is through getting really good nutrition. There's sort of nutrition science done that's as rigorous, and ironclad is the science and the fields like physics that I grew up in. And it's much harder to do in nutrition because you're dealing with real human beings and biologists that they're different creatures and, for instance, elementary particles or circuits. So we were doing this the nights and weekends type endeavor. And a year ago in November, I did a podcast called Econ Talk with Russ Roberts. Was an economist at GW University, in, uh, um, and a couple of days after this podcast, I got an email from a fellow named John Arnold who said he runs a foundation in Houston. They don't do obesity research, but they're interested in getting into it. 
funds or obesity funding that I had mentioned a couple of experiments on the air. And so anyway, one thing led to another. Um, turns out that John Arnold's a, a very wealthy philanthropist, uh, and his foundation is doing some amazing things. And after a long, uh, many conversations and meetings, they agreed to support the uh, Nutrition Science Initiative. So we, we now have offices in San Diego, and we have a staff, and they've also committed a significant amount of money to experiments that we want to fund. And we put together a consortium of researchers, influential, thoughtful obesity researchers who have been in the field for a long time, who, without exception, uh, think I'm wrong, think we're wrong, <laughs> but acknowledge that their belief that it's all about calories and energy balance is not uh, demonstrated unambiguously in the literature, that there's a lot of room for this alternative hypothesis that obesity is a hormonal regulatory defect driven by the carbohydrate, triggered by the carbohydrate content. So we've, uh, they've designed an experiment beginning with a pilot experiment that will directly test this hypothesis. I can't give details yet until contracts are in place. Everybody's very um, hesitant publicly, but uh, experiments that should uh, really, like I said, be able to disassociate weight loss from eating less or exercising more. Mm -hmm. And the laws of thermodynamics will still hold, but you'll, <laughs> because they always do, but you'll change the macronutrient composition of the diet dramatically and, and in an inpatient setting. So one of the key problems we identified with all much of uh, existing uh, obesity research, first of all, it's done in the context, everyone thinks this is all about what diet works best, because it's clear that we get facts we need too much. That's the right assumption. And so if you're studying dietary manipulations, it's only saying something about what diet works best, and then they do what called free living experiments. You know, it's say 500 subjects, if you've got a lot of money and you randomize them into two or four groups and you give their group different diet books and different counseling and you set them off into the world and you let them, and then they come back in three months and six months and one year and two years and you measure them and do blood tests and look at heart disease risk factors and then you say which diet is better or worse. And in this, even in this scenario, the low carb diet always ends up doing better than the others. But it's equally clear that nobody stays on the diet. So my metaphor for this, imagine if you wanted to know whether cigarettes cause lung cancer and your way of doing it was to take 500 people and randomize them to four groups and put one group on the nicotine patch and one group on nicotine gum and one group got nicotine nasal spray and the fourth group had to try and quit cold turkey. Maybe the fifth group smoke, and then you followed them for two years, and lo and behold, at the end of two years, virtually everyone was still smoking. And then you concluded that from this that cigarettes don't cause lung cancer. <laughs> and this is pretty much what they do. So they, they say, look, at the end of two years, <clears throat> everyone's fallen off their diet. They've all lost four pounds on average. doesn't matter what diet we put them on, therefore, this demonstrates that obesity is all about calories, and you got to eat less if you want to lose weight. So what we want to do is put people in a metabolic ward in an inpatient setting, and they get fed particular diets. This is a simple way to think of this. So <clears throat> um, figure out how much energy somebody expends, which is a relatively uh, straightforward process, and then you put them on a diet, say, no carbohydrates or a diet with a lot of carbohydrates, but you make sure that what they're eating is the same amount of energy that they expend every day. So you match intake to expenditure, or you could even increase intake over expenditure. You do your olive oil experiment. <laughs> and then you see what happens to fat mass. 
and energy expenditure, when you know exactly how much they started expending and you know exactly how much they're giving them, and you know they're eating it because they're locked in this metabolic war, they can't cheat. You watch them, they monitor them. So they did a very rigorously well-controlled experiment, the kind of thing you're taught to do in eighth grade science, <clears throat> which is control your variables. Then you pick one variable. You can't only pick one variable to change in diets because if you change, say, the, car the carbohydrate content, you've got to replace it with something. So you might replace it by adding fat or protein. But you try to minimize the number of variables that are changed. You try to control everything. And by doing this, we should be able to resolve these controversies. It's expensive. A lot more expensive than we imagined. But it seems like we're going to be in fat money to pay for this. So it should be, hopefully, within three or four years, when I'm pretty convinced. That's awesome, Guy. I'm really, really looking forward to that research because I think. Uh, if we can add that to the pretty unambiguous at this point research, for example, that just exercising more does not lead to uh, fat loss, which again, I mean, uh, even even your you know your the organization you're associated with, the New York Times, seems to report on this at least four times a year. All this research is showing that exercise isn't really important for fat loss, and that no good study has ever really shown that it does. But they're like, well, you should still exercise. <laughs> so, so I'm curious yeah. if we'll be able to then take the science, which is relatively unambiguous, because there's plenty of areas where it is pretty unambiguous, but then get people to, again, like you said, you know, you, these, these, these arguments seem pretty straightforward. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping this will set it over the edge. I, and, I, and I applaud you for, for getting the funding and doing the research. I'm very excited to see it. Um, yeah, it'll be, it's interesting. I mean, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see whether we can get people to accept studies for what they are. One of the issues we talk about a lot is, you know, as you talk about the New York Times every week, they have two, four diet, nutrition, health stories, or exercise stories. So the question is, how, if you do the best experiment ever done by two orders of magnitude, um, How do you get the press and the research community to understand that it's the best experiment ever done and that it trumps what's been done since? Yeah. So my nightmare is they do this experiment, they get the results that we would expect. They might not. This is science. You never know. We could be wrong. And, um, but assuming they get the experiment and then they publish it and it shows up in the New Journal of Medicine or JAMA and then it's, you know, it's, it's on the front page of the New York Times. One hopes because it's this dramatic results contrary to all conventional wisdom and then two days later there's another story and then there's a piece about the new animal experiment and then there's a piece about some grad students poster session at a conference in Montana and you know everything just keeps rolling along in this huge establishment that's grown up to generate nutrition you know, they, it's almost as though there can't be a right answer right because then what are we going to say mm-hmm what, what, how are we going to fill the pages of these newspapers? So there's got to be an endless contrast. So it's, anyway, but yeah, it'll be interesting. And and one of the things we love about that's so great about the Arnold Foundation, part of their um, strategy as a philanthropy is to make sure that the, the ways they invest the money have that, that it's not just um, like throwing a book in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, you know that it has an effect that that so that we. You know, we talk to the journalists, we talk to the research community, we talk to the policymakers so they know, um, you know, why this is being done and what the goal is and what this, why it's different from other experiments and why it, it feasibly trumps the other experiments and what makes it such a game changer, assuming it's a result. Uh, which, which, uh, if you're previous work is any indication of, of what will be your future work, I have all the confidence in the world that it will, Gary, because uh, you, you've certainly started changing the game already, so I'm, I'm very excited to see the results here. It'll be interesting. It'll be, uh... <laughs> um, 
<laughs> no, I love it. I love it. It'll be in, well. It'll be in, it will be interesting. The question is, what type of interesting will it be? There's no. It, it, this, yeah, there will yeah. be an exciting ending to this movie. We just don't know what the ending will be. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that's a good way to put it. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. So I know you're an extremely busy man, and I appreciate you sharing your time with us today. And I literally have another half page of notes here. So if if you'd be so willing, we'd love to have you back on the show in a few months. Yeah, you know, I'd love to do it again. Um, thanks for having me, and I may even be coherent. If you do it. <laughs> well, everybody, if you haven't checked out Gary's work, please do check out Good Calories, Bad Calories, a little bit more ambitious of a text. Uh, don't be intimidated by it, though. It will change your life. And if you need a little on-road onto that book, uh, read his second book, which is called Why We Get Fat. And I know he didn't want to include this part in the title, but and what we can do about it. I remember that interview you were in. He was like, I didn't want to add that, but my publisher made me. And uh, please do check out uh, NUSI or NUSI.org and help support them. Share it, Facebook, Twitter. Keep the momentum going. I personally think we're at right position on the edge of a tipping point. And I think uh, Gary organization, NUSI, is going to be a, a pivotal role in tipping us over the edge. So thank you again. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. And remember, this week and every week after, eat more and exercise less, but do that smarter. Talk to you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like what you heard today, please help share the sanity by sharing today's show on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and whatever new virtual reality flying car jetpack social networking thing comes out tomorrow. But seriously, we need your help to end the obesity and diabetes epidemic. So please take seven seconds right now and share this show. Together, we really can make a difference and we can have a lot of fun doing it. And hey, if you like food and if you like saving time grocery shopping and if you like saving money, then I bet you will love the super convenient veggies, delicious protein, and craving killing healthy snacks that you will find at store.sanesolution.com. Again, that's store.sanesolution.com. And if you're looking for fun, practical ways to help parents and children go sane together, come join the party in the Sane Families program. We'll invite you into our homes and lives and show you a doable step-by-step process for raising a healthy family. Learn more at learndobecome.com forward slash same.